Good morning. Welcome to Process Injection Techniques, Gotta Catch Them All in South Seas CDF with uh, Itzi Kotler and Amit Klein. Before we begin, I have a few brief notes. Stop by the business hall located in Mandalay Bay, Oceanside, and Shoreline Ballrooms on level two during the day, and for the welcome reception at 5.30 p.m. tonight. The Black Hat Arsenal is in the business hall on level two, Lunch will be served in Bayside AB from 1 p.m. until 2.30 p.m. Don't forget the merchandise store on level two as well. And thank you for putting your phones on vibrate. We're ready to get started. Thank you. Thank you, Lena, and welcome to our uh, presentation about process injection techniques. And we have uh, Itzik Kotler here, and this is uh, some words about Itzik. And my name is Amit Klein, and you can read a bit about me there. Uh, and we started researching uh, process injection uh, techniques back in uh, late 2018. Uh, we wanted to explore this area and to see if we can find uh, new techniques and something interesting uh, to say about this. And uh, pretty much, pretty soon, we discovered that there is actually no comprehensive collection or catalog or compendium of process injection techniques. Moreover, there was no separation of uh, what we call a true process injection techniques from uh, a more liberal uh, uh, approach taken by some authors to this term, uh, wherein they lumped into process injection uh, some related but uh, not true process injection techniques like holo process hollowing or spawning. Uh, we did not find uh, any uh, categorization system uh, for uh, describing the differences between the sub-techniques such as uh, memory allocation, memory writing, and, um, and uh, code execution. There was no analysis and comparison between the various techniques out there. And there was no update for Windows 10, uh, as uh, several uh, techniques are pretty old from the, back, from the Windows XP days uh, and the 32-bit architecture, and it was not clear to us whether they can be ported as is to Windows 10 with its new security uh, mechanisms and uh, the 64-bit architecture. Before we proceed, uh, let me uh, do some kudos and give some kudos to the individuals and companies uh, for inventing and developing, documenting, and, pro and, and providing proof of concept to many, many uh, process injection techniques. Uh, among them are Adam of Hexacorn, Ojan, uh, the people at Ensilo, uh, and uh, Xaba Fitzel, also known as the Evil Bit, and there are, of course, many, many more uh, authors and contributors. And of course, hat tip to Endgame uh, for providing the first compilation of uh, injection techniques, although not all of them were true process injection techniques. So how do we, how do we define pr true process injection? Uh, it's in, 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 injecting code or logic from one live user space process, which is typically malware, uh, to another live user space process, which the target of the injection, which is uh, typically a benign or, uh, or a, a legitimate process. This is in contrast of in contrast to uh, process spawning and hollowing, uh, also some other pre-execution techniques like DLL hijacking, a APP cert, APP init, LSP providers, image file execution options, etc. What's so interesting about Windows 10 and uh, six, the 64-bit architecture? Well, in Windows 10, there were several uh, new security mechanisms introduced to uh, mitigate uh, remote process uh, exploitation, but they also have a significant impact on uh, process injection, on local process injection. Specifically, CFG, Control Flow Guard, prevents indirect calls to non-approved addresses, and the CIG, the Code Integrity Guard, only allows modules or DLLs signed by Microsoft or Microsoft Store or WHQL to be loaded into the process memory, and they, we will explain exactly how this uh, affects process injection. Uh, the x64 architecture, as opposed to uh, x86, the 32-bit architecture, ha uh, has a different calling convention, wherein the first four arguments uh, are stored in volatile registers, RCX, RDX, R8, and R9. So invo invoking functions, for example, from a ROP gadget or from other uh, mechanisms, uh, necessitates control over some or all these registers, which is sometimes hard to come by. Also, in uh, x64, there is no pop all registers, so this makes it difficult uh, to uh, populate uh, registers with uh, desired values in ROP gadgets and so forth. Uh, we found a lot of proof of concepts uh, for process injection out there. They were excellent proof of concepts in the sense that uh, they were not, not just good proof of concepts, they were excellent ones. 
and they were excellent ones because they checked for uh, error conditions and exceptions. They uh, handled both 32-bit uh, architecture and 64-bit architecture. In fact, when they wanted to demonstrate a specific, say, memory writing technique, they coupled it with some execution technique to provide an end-to-end -end process injection demonstration, including, in this case, uh, a... Uh, an arbitrary, uh, executing arbitrary code, a user chosen arbitrary code. This made a proof of concept pretty large. In this case, if you can read it, it's uh, 1,500 lines of code. Uh, and for a researcher to try to figure out what exactly is the innovation here, where, what is the essence of the technique, it becomes very difficult. As opposed to what we would, what, what we had in mind is something like the right hand side, where you, there are five, there are three lines actually, uh, they, they show up as five because uh, we have a word wrapping here, uh, detailing the exact writing technique. And that's what we were missing uh, in the proof of concept or in the discussions uh, that, uh, that existed to date. So the scope of our research is therefore true process injection, running a sequence of logic or commands in the target process as opposed to uh, uh, making the target process spawn another process, which is far less interesting. Uh, recent Windows 10, let's say version 1803 and above, 64-bit uh, in, uh, injecting process, 64-bit target process, both medium integrity, non, no requirement for uh, administrative rights. And uh, we wanted to evaluate uh, the process injection techniques against Windows 10 protection, specifically CFG and CIG. With respect to CFG, uh, what we had in mind, or what we discovered, that there are, two, there are three story strategies uh, for handling CFG. Either the attacker, the malware, disables CFG in the target process, which is possible through a standard Windows API set process valid call targets. However, if you think about it, this invocation is in itself quite suspicious for one process to, to inflict on another. And also, it may be disabled or restricted in the future by Microsoft because, it's, because it, it may be too potent. And then the, the, we can do, uh, we can allocate or set the ex uh, executable memory uh, thereby making all the allocations CFG valid. Uh, this is then using virtual alloc EX, virtual protect EX, and others. However, what we have here is one process allocating executable pages in another process, and we all understand what's going to happen next. So this is extremely suspicious activity. So uh, an attacker probably wants to avoid that one as well. Which leaves us with the third option, which is the most difficult and most uh, and hardest to come by and therefore most interesting, which is playing by the rules. So what, we, what the attacker needs to do is write a non-executable data, is typically a rough chain, and then use some CFG agnostic execution method to run a stack pivot and start executing the ROP gadget. Uh, and the, the emphasis is on CFG agnostic execution method, which is the uh, a rare minor minority of the uh, in, uh, execution methods, as, as we'll see later. Uh, regarding other defenses, including CIG, uh, they, they could be turned off by, uh, use, by invoking locally set process mitigation policy, which takes three arguments and therefore could be used with MTQ APC thread to execute at the target process. However, this, as of 1809, does not work. Uh, among those uh, protection mechanisms, CIG is the most painful for process injection because it prevents loading of uh, arbitrary DLLs. So what are the typical process injection building blocks? We have memory allocation, uh, which may be implicit if we use a code cave or stack or, or, or a known heap location. Uh, we need to consider page permission issues. Is it, uh, can, can we allocate executable uh, pages or not? Uh, what control we have over the allocation address uh, and whether the addresses are CFG valid. Uh, and then we need to write something useful to, into that memory. Uh, and the question, when, and with memory writing technique, the questions are what, what we can write. Can we write arbitrary data or is it restricted in size or in character set? And whether the write is atomic or not. Finally, there's the execution technique, and the questions are whether the target uh, has to be a CFG valid address, what control do we have over the registers, and what limitations or prerequisites there are for this execution technique, and there are a lot of techniques that are quite restricted. So without much ado, uh, let's go over uh, to process injection techniques. I'm going to describe some uh, interesting, some uh, known, and then some interesting and lesser known techniques, and, and Try to, uh, try to analyze and, and provide some uh, insights about them. 
So we start with the classic memory allocation technique in which uh, we allocate the memory in the target process using virtual alloc EX. Uh, as, we, as we all know, we can uh, allocate executable pages by simply by requesting the page execute uh, property uh, flag. And for such executable pages, Windows conveniently automatically sets all the region to be CFG valid, comes in very handy. Uh, as a variant, we can allocate only read-write pages and then add the executable uh, flag using virtual ProtectDX. In that case as well, uh, Windows automatically sets all the region to be CFG valid. And then we have the classic write process memory, memory writing technique. Uh, the, with write process memory, there are no restrictions and no limitations. The address is fully controlled by us. And uh, with CFG, if the allocation is sets the execution privileges, then all, we know already that all the region is CFG valid, as, so, which makes us very happy. And CG has no impact because we're not talking about DLLs here. And finally, there's the classic execution technique where using create remote thread uh, has no prerequisites, uh, no impact for CIG. For, uh, for CFG, the target execution should be a valid CFG target, meaning Windows will check at the remote process if the address is CFG valid, and if it's not, it will crash. And as, of, as for registers, we only control a single register, RCX, so whatever we invoke here has to take up to one uh, argument. Uh, we also have a classic DLL injection execution techniques. Uh, one of them would be using create remote thread again, assuming that we already have the uh, DLL path in memory using one of the uh, one uh, uh, using a, a writing technique. Uh, then you, we can invoke create remote thread that invokes load library A, with the single argument being a pointer to this uh, to the memory that we filled with the DLL path. Uh, as a pre the prerequisites are pretty obvious. Uh, the DLL should be on disk. We, should, we need to have a writing technique to write the DLL path to the target process. Interestingly, the execution occurs because the loader, lo the loader runs DLL main uh, during, the DLL, during loading, the loading of the DLL. Uh, and this DLL main function uh, is restricted because it's uh, executed under the loader lock. So there are several restrictions. Uh, we, there's a URL in our paper show the, that uh, provides information from Microsoft what, such, what those restrictions are. Nevertheless, it's still very useful. Uh, CFG has no impact on this uh, uh, technique because uh, load library A is obviously a CFG valid uh, address in the target process. However, CIG will block this technique assuming that this DLL is not signed by Microsoft and unless you have the Microsoft code signing key, the uh, CIG will block this, uh, this execution method. Um, I want to note that this variant can, uh, the, there are variants using QUser APC and NTQAPC thread uh, coming, uh, which uh, uh, end up with the same conditions more or less. Another classic DLL injection technique uh, is using set Windows hook X, uh, in which case uh, the idea here is that uh, this deal, that we, the uh, malware provides uh, Windows with a DLL to be loaded whenever a specific uh, uh, event is triggered in the uh, in the target process. Uh, and f following this uh, set Windows hook X, we trigger we uh, artificially trigger this uh, condition, this, uh, uh, this event in the target thread um, and so, so that uh, it forces loading our DLL and executing the uh, event handler function in this DLL. Of course, the prerequisite is that uh, there's DLL on disk and it uh, exports the required function, which is obviously under the attacker's control, no problems there. And again, CIG will block this technique. Uh, we are moving to the classic APC execution technique, which uses QUser APC, the uh, Windows API standard function, or the internal uh, function NTQAPC thread, which is uh, more flexible. Uh, the prerequisites here starts to be, start becoming interesting because we here we require that the thread must be in an alertable state, and I'll explain this, that in the next slide. Uh, CIG has, of course, no impact, and, the C and CFG uh, requires that the target execution be a valid CFG target. As for registers, you can see that in QUser APC, we only control RCX, one register, one, uh, one argument function, whereas in NTQ Q APC thread, we control RCX, RDX, and the lower half of R8, so we have uh, control over two and a half registers. So what is this uh, uh, alertable, what, what does it mean for, for a thread to be in an alertable state? Well, 
taking it straight from Microsoft uh, documentation, it means that the thread is in, inside one of the, is run, is, is uh, uh, sus not sus in, in idling in one of the five next functions, sleep EX, wait for single object EX, wait for multiple objects EX, signal object and wait, and real MSG wait for multiple objects EX. And actually, for a complex enough software like Office Software Explorer, uh, browsers, it's quite common to, to find at least one thread in an alertable state. If you think about it, uh, any thread that waits for an object, waits for a signal, uh, uh, actually is in an alertable state. Uh, and also of importance here, and I don't think that this is uh, documented elsewhere, is that it's quite easy to detect this uh, alertable, that the thread is in an, in an alertable state because all those internal functions in which the thread is actually uh, parking, uh, it will be at the uh, uh, function entry plus uh, hex 14, which is, uh, right, which is the RIP right after the syscall. All those five internal functions share the same structure and it's always a syscall uh, and uh, at the end of the syscall it's uh, hex uh, 14. So if you see the RIP for thread in, in, in sleep EX say plus uh, hex 14 or in signal object and wait plus hex 14, it means that the thread is in an alertable state, otherwise it is not in an alertable state. Um, moving to the, yeah, so that was the uh, APC style execution, and now moving to a classic thread hijacking execution technique, uh, suspend, inject, and resume, uh, SIR for short. Uh, again, the naive uh, representation of this attack is uh, opening the thread, suspending the thread, um, and then using set thread context with, uh, uh, with our RIP pointing at our desired uh, location and resume thread and the thread is resumed with the uh, RIP in our desired location and start executing our code. Now, there are no prerequisites actually to this technique. Uh, CFG, surprisingly enough, has no impact uh, except for RSP which is uh, restricted to the, if we choose to change the RSP value, it has to remain within the stack region. Uh, as for control over registers, here's a puzzle. In some processes, we could uh, exert control over all registers uh, using a set thread context. In other processes, more interesting processes, I admit, we could not modify uh, or we could not control the volatile registers, RAX, RCX, RDX, and R8 to R11. The reason why some, th some processes are, uh, are more uh, um, controllable and some are less controllable is somewhat of a puzzle to me and uh, probably requires more, uh, more research or maybe there's something uh, I, I'm missing. Uh, at any rate, our assumption is that we have no control over the volatile registers and as I mentioned earlier, control over RSP is limited to stack reservation. Um, if, our t if we do not have the ability to write executable code pages into the target process, we can use, uh, we can use uh, uh, um, data there as drop chain, uh, in which case uh, we set the, uh, the RIP of the thread uh, to a stack pivot gadget to set the RSP to the control memory and, uh, and uh, the return command will start executing the drop chain uh, uh, instead of running uh, native code. Here's a less known but very impressive technique uh, from I think 2007 called ghost writing. It's a monolithic technique in the sense that uh, it, uh, it allows um, writing, uh, it, it combines writing and execution. It's similar to thread hijacking but it has uh, all the built-in uh, memory writing part. So memory writing is achieved in, in steps, uh, in writing a one keyword uh, in each step and uh, using set thread context to set the registers. And at the end of each step, the thread is, is uh, locked in an infinite loop, which is a success marker for us, uh, telling us we can move to the next step. So the required ROP gadgets are, we have a sync gadget, this infinite loop, as simple as, uh, as, as jump minus two, so it, it loops forever. Uh, then we also have, need to have a write gadget, something like move uh, to the address in RDI, uh, the contents of RBX, and, and do a return later. And a stack pivot of, or something equivalent. In the first step, we just write the, uh, write the uh, onto the stack 
the address of the uh, infinite loop and, and, and uh, return to that so the infinite loop starts running. Uh, once we detect that, we again set the thread context uh, uh, to say, uh, to, into writing arbitrary keywords using RDI and RBX and setting RSP one step, one step back uh, so that when the right, uh, uh, right gadget will finish with return, it will jump back to the infinite loop. And once we have uh, uh, built the memory to our uh, desire, we can move to the execution by executing a, a stack pivot using set thread context again. Um, some tips about regarding unused stack as memory, which we, uh, uh, we can use in this technique and as well in the stack bombing technique that we'll describe in a moment. Uh, it's, um, uh, we can maintain, we need to maintain distance from the official top of stack. So in order to leave room for win API call stack, meaning uh, we need to allow the stack to grow a bit uh, when some internal functions are invoked. Uh, otherwise, if we do not do that, if we, write, if we use the stack right, uh, right behind TOS, uh, it will get uh, uh, mangled or, 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 or wiped by, uh, by invoking internal functions. And so no good, so need some, to keep some distance. We, we, we can't go too far uh, because the stack is limited to one megabyte typically. Uh, so in order to achieve those goals, we need to grow the stack uh, by touching memory at page size intervals uh, because uh, if, we, if we do, the, once we touch this, uh, uh, once we touch the uh, guard page, uh, the, the stack grows accordingly. Uh, also, when writing code, uh, uh, use, when writing code using this uh, new stack location, mind the, the alignment required from stack, which is 16 bytes. So back to analyzing ghost writing. The prerequisite is simply that we have uh, writable memory. Uh, as uh, we can use, as, as, as hinted before, we can use uh, this, uh, unused, the unused part of the stack. Uh, CFG has no impact. Except, uh, our, except for the restriction over RSP. CIG obviously has no impact, and uh, we have four control over registers. There's no guaranteed control over volatile registers, as I mentioned before, and as I said, uh, control over RSP is limited. Um, another interesting uh, writing technique is uh, assuming that there is a shared memory uh, section in the target uh, process. In such case, uh, assuming that we know this uh, shared memory uh, uh, name, shared memory section name and size, which can, we can easily find out assuming uh, back at home, assuming that we know which software we target and which build it is, because these things don't change a lot. Uh, we open this uh, shared memory, map this shared memory to the malware process. We write our payload at the end of this uh, shared memory section. Uh, and finally, we, we search, we open the, the target process and we search for sections that are, for memory regions that have uh, the same properties as the shared memory in terms of size and, and, uh, and flags. And if, once we find that, we, all, we read the last bytes of, those, of, that shared me of that memory area in the target process, we compare it to our payload and if it's indeed the shared memory region, then our then this then we'll find a match, and we will we will what we have at hand at this moment is our payload at a known location at a known address in the target process, and then we can proceed to do whatever we like with this uh, with this data. So the prerequisites are obviously that the target process has read write shared memory, the attack, and that the attacker knows this name the name and size of this uh, shared memory. Um, CFG is not interesting. This is a, write pro, uh, a memory writing technique, and CIG has no impact. We're not dealing with DLLs here. Moving to the atom bombing writing technique. So, uh, as, I, as we saw earlier, the full uh, proof of concept is 1,500 lines of code, but the essence of the technique, assuming some uh, 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 simplifications here, like we, let's say the payload length is, uh, is smaller than 256 bytes, and assuming that there are no null bytes in the payload except the terminating null bytes, 
what we simply need to do in the Mauer process is define an atom object for Windows with this payload uh, as the content, and then using anti-QAPC thread, which can invoke uh, any function in the target process up to, with up to three arguments, we invoke the global get atom name A, uh, with this atom name, the target uh, address for the uh, uh, for, for the payload uh, and the size of, and the size of the payload, uh, and and it will run global get atom name A in the uh, target process, which will copy the atom data the, the payload into the desired address, which is very neat. Uh, the original paper uh, does not write uh, null bytes. Uh, they assume that the, uh, the, the target memory is zeroed out because they use a, a, a code cave. Uh, and we devised the technique to write null bytes. It's all in our paper if you're interested. Uh, the prerequisites here is because we use a, the, an APC execution technique, uh, the thread must be in an alertable state, but that's not typically a problem. Um, and this is a writing technique, so there's no impact for CFG, and for CIG is, is irrelevant because it's not a DLL. Uh, and another interesting uh, allocation plus writing technique they, uh, they are uh, um, lumped together in this, in this one is the forcing uh, mapping of a section on the target process. Uh, in this case, uh, we define a section in the, in the malware. We fill it with our, with our data, and then we forcefully map it into the target process using NT-map view of section, which also allocates, uh, the, allocates the memory in the target section. And if we ask for page execute, it will also set the whole memory region uh, to be CFG valid. The downside is that it cannot be used for an already allocated memory. So this one cannot be used to, say, write data on the stack. Um, and as for CFG, as I mentioned earlier, the memory allocated with page execution privileges becomes, becomes a valid CFG target, which is very neat. And here is a cute uh, execution technique. It's uh, what we call unmap uh, plus rewrite, uh, in which we, we unmap uh, a prominent DLL in the target process. Uh, specifically, NTDLL is, is, uh, is, of course, the uh, uh, probably uh, ideal choice. Uh, what we need to do is to unmap this, uh, this DLL and then, uh, and then map, a, map a section back exactly in the same size to the exact address of the original anti-DLL in the target process. Uh, and so, the when, so next time whenever an anti-DLL function is invoked, our own code will run. Uh, the way to do it is a bit more tricky and requires uh, attention to details. First, of course, the process, the whole process, the whole target process needs to be suspended. Otherwise, uh, if someone, if some thread will invoke function at NTDLL or once NTDLL is, is unmapped but before our code is there, it will obviously crash the, the process. Then, we can't just write data there. We need to retain, retain the, uh, the context of, of many uh, uh, st internal variable, anti DLL variables. To do so, what we need to do is copy the original content of the whole anti DLL region to the uh, malware process, then patch some functions of anti DLL, like anti close, and then write this data back to the, uh, um, to the target process instead of the once we unmap the original. Uh, uh, NTDLL. Otherwise, if we don't do that, uh, it will, the process is very likely to crash because of inconsistencies. And of course, we need to flush the instruction cache uh, in order to tell the CPU not to use the old, any old code from the old NTDLL it, it, it cached. Uh, since all the, or, uh, 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 some, some, since the memory that we allocate in, uh, uh, inside the uh, target process uh, replaces the old NTDLL, any, uh, all entry points in NTDLL, all functions in NTDLL must be CFG valid. Fortunately, if we use either virtual alloc X or NTMAP view of section, this is taken care of. Uh, 
And then there is a bunch of uh, callback override execution techniques, what we call. Uh, I lumped together a whole lot of uh, execution techniques starting with set window, long PTR, propagate, control inject, ALPC, WNF, and the whole shutter-like techniques uh, together because they share the same concept. What they do is they write the uh, target code or logic into the, uh, into the target process, and then the execution revolves around finding or obtaining a memory address of an object with a virtual table, specific object or specific callback function or specific uh, function table, uh, which in itself may be tricky because the object may, may or may not be there depending on the nature of the process. For example, whether the process uses ALPC or not, whether the process is in console application or not, whether the process uh, has a private clipboard or not. It's not a, it's not a very generic uh, approach is what I'm saying. Uh, this finding slash obtaining can be done either via the, a, a standard Windows API, like get window long PTR, or via a memory search, uh, which is the case for ALPC, the, the LPC uh, attack. Uh, once this object is found, we, re we replace the object or the callback function using one of the writing techniques or using the standard uh, API if it applies, like uh, set window hook X, uh, set, uh, sorry, set uh, window long PTR, to point at, uh, at our Cho choice, chosen function or code. And uh, this, this, for all such techniques, must be CFG valid targets. Uh, and it also, we, it may require some object or code adjustments in order to make the process uh, stable, not crash. Finally, we trigger the execution. Uh, again, this may be tricky in some techniques or some approaches as the, uh, as the uh, uh, triggering event may or may not be deterministic. And post, ex post uh, uh, injection, we need to restore the original object or callback. Here's an example, a very uh, concise uh, and, and, and simplified example. I'm using control inject as an example. Uh, the idea here is that uh, uh, a console application, mind you, this is now a, quite a restricted set of processes, a console application uh, stores a, a handler for the control inject event in its uh, kernel-based uh, single handler uh, variable. Uh, there's a bit of a complication here because the, the pointer stored there is uh, encoded. Fortunately, we can use uh, uh, we can use the function RTL encode remote pointer from within the malware process itself to encode uh, our target uh, uh, our target code location uh, using the using the encoding scheme or using the key uh, of the target uh, process. So once we do that, we copy this address. The, we copy the the, the encoded uh, pointer to kernel-based single handler at the target process using any memory writing technique, technique we like. Uh, and, and of course, we have our code there uh, already using any memory writing technique uh, we like. And finally, what remains to do is to, for us to do is to trigger the execution. And we do that by simulating uh, the control C event. Uh, first, we, send, we, we simulate pressing control uh, and, uh, using send input. And then we simulate pressing uh, the C character with post message. And that's, once that happens, uh, this function is invoked and code starts running, our code starts running in the target process. And now, finally, we move to our own uh, little set of uh, uh, new techniques. Uh, we first describe a memory writing technique using a memset or, and memmove, which has some uh, uh, very uh, interesting properties. Uh, what we do here is assuming that we, is we write our, our uh, data to the destination, to the target um, uh, process, byte by byte, using memset, and invoking memset uh, in the target process using uh, NTQAPC thread. Now remember, it takes uh, it, it can invoke function a function with three arguments. For, fortunately, memset uses exactly three arguments. The destination address, which we control, the one-byte data, 
And the length, which for us, uh, the, the interesting length is, the, the useful length is one. This way, we invoke memset once and write a single byte in uh, any desired address in the target process. We can do a loop over and, and write whatever we like and write arbitrary data to arbitrary memory location in memory locations in the process, in the target process. And finally, we can uh, make it atomic by by writing the data to some temporary uh, address not in use, temporary buffer not in use, and then copying the buffer uh, co uh, uh, in a single atomic step using memmove, which allows us to move to, to, to uh, uh, using, a, again, an NTQAPC thread uh, with memmove, taking three arguments, destination address, uh, uh, source address, and length, thereby we can achieve atomic memory writing. Uh, CFG, note that uh, uh, although we invoke uh, NTQAPC thread, uh, CFG has no effect on us because the uh, target functions, the uh, memset and memmove, are of course CFG valid. Uh, and we can write to any address, in fact. The only prerequisite is that the thread must be in an alertable state uh, and the memory should be allocated, which are uh, not, not a serious problems. And finally, we describe here our uh, stack bombing execution technique, uh, which is a new execution technique. Uh, in this case, the idea is, is pretty simple. Uh, we are using a get thread context to obtain the thread's uh, uh, top of stack, the thread's uh, RSP. And if the thread is in an alertable state, as I'm taking a, a simple example here, it means that when the thread <coughs> resumes from its alertable state, as, we'll, as, as we see here, uh, it will immediately, after the syscall, it will immediately return. There is no manipulation of the stack, there is no manipulation of registers, which is very handy. So once this, if the stack, if the th target thread is in an alertable state, it means that if we now write uh, the address of the, of, of the destination code in the address of, uh, pointed by RSP, uh, the thread will, uh, ac will actually branch, the, the return in the thread will immediately branch to our own uh, code. And that's essentially the idea. Uh, in our uh, POC in the white paper and in, in Pinjector, uh, we will see this. We, we will see that. We will see how we uh, implemented this using uh, the unused stack as, as an additional memory. We built their uh, ROP gadget, and we have this uh, the thread actually uh, running uh, running um, a, a stack pivot into the ROP gadget and start executing our ROP gadget. And all this without. Uh, resorting to uh, allocating executable memory in the target process. Okay. Uh, so, uh, the prerequisites are that the third is in an alertable state, uh, there's no impact over CFG, and as I mentioned, the paper in Pinjectra includes the fully functional code. Uh, we, all, we also looked at three, uh, two, uh, uh, we also discovered two methods that no longer work. If anyone, if anyone can uh, provide us with uh, a working example, we'll be much delighted. And to summarize, we've seen uh, several uh, writing techniques, uh, actually five of them, and these are our proper, their properties. We've seen a lot, over 20 execution techniques, uh, but only four of them are CFG agnostic. The thread execution hijacking, so suspend, inject, resume, ghost writing, unmap and override, and our own stack bombing. Um, if you're interested in loading a DLL into uh, the target process without writing, a system DLL without writing its name first, uh, Fortunately, we have a nice trick for you. You can use a uh, kernel base. It contains a list of over 1,000 uh, system DLL names, including MSHTML, Shell32, and WinInet.dll. So if your favorite ROP gadget happens to be there and the DLL is not already loaded, here's a nifty way of loading your, your system DLL into a target process. And now I'm handing it over to Itzik. Thank you, Amit. Okay, so as Amit mentioned, in addition to the theory that we did and the research, we're going to release a tool today called Injectra. Injectra implements all the different techniques that Amit has just detailed, as well as the stack bombing technique that we have introduced. 
So you can go right now to GitHub and download your copy. It's free, it's open source. Let's talk about what's the high level structure of Conjectra and a little bit about the philosophy of the design before it. So Conjectra is a Visual Studio solution that contains four projects. As Amit mentioned, some of the attacks require DLL artifacts, so we provide those out of the box. That's account for the first two. And then we have the Pinjrekpa tool itself that contains the demo and the techniques. And for your convenience, we also included the test process, a dummy program that in sometimes will also put the, um, the thread in the alertable state. As Amit mentioned, it's a prerequisite for some of the techniques. So conveniently, the program will do it for you as well. Now, stepping back a little bit about what's the philosophy behind Pinjectra. So as Amit mentioned, the research took a lot of effort collecting different scrapes and organized them together into a framework. We decided to take it to the next step and we basically utilize C and C++ static type system to create and basically break down the concept into two different classes types that together can combine into a process injection execution. So how does it look like? So here is the first example of how you implement stack bombing with Pinjectra. The first class is providing the code execution. And again, this is a thread suspend inject resume. Not to be confused with the other technique that Amit has presented, this is just a conceptual uh, logic of what's going to happen. And then the second class is the actual writing to the memory. As you can see, NetQAPC thread with memset. And the third class is actually the implementation of the payload. So as you can see, you can easily mix and match. You can take every different class and you can prototype existing techniques and expand them, or you can try different components. And now, let's have a demo. Okay, so what do we see here? There's two CMDs windows, one of them is a green, that's gonna be the victim, the other one's gonna be the red, that's gonna be the attacker process. First, we launch the test program. As you can see, it will print for con your convenience the PAD, TAD, and put the threads into an alertable state. Then we're gonna switch into Pinjectra. We're gonna run it without any arguments. We're gonna get the usage. The usage detail all the different techniques and combination. Again, it's just a demo tool, not limiting the possibility, just common frequency combinations. And then once we choose the right combination, we enter the details of the process ID and the thread ID, and the injection will happen. The payload right now that the program is designed to run with is a simple hello world pop box that you can see that just popped here. That's essentially the completion and the visual indicator that the injection was successful. Thank you. <laughs> Moving on to the uh, second technique, as Amit mentioned, the ghost writing. It's uh, very exotic, very interesting to implement. As you can see again, the first top class controlled the code execution. Second class controlled the actual writing. Here we implemented the ghost writing technique. And then another a different payload that match together. And let's see how it works. Again, we invoke the test program. Making sure it's running. Yep. Going back into the uh, Injectra. Again, we will run it again just to see all the different options. Again, the payload here is a visual indication of the low world box. Again, another successful process injection. Okay, so for the, uh, for the quick ones, you can see that this first class has already been used in the past. So if you look at the process suspend inject and resume complex, that's the same class that we use for the stack bombing. Again, the concept of the mix and match and reusable components really starts to give back at this point. Here, we only need to implement the unmap and map using a specific writer, which is a combination of the create file, map view file, unmap, and then view it again. And again, this combination, together with the payload that has been passed uh, specifically, will result in a process injection technique. 
So again, this is just how easy it is to either prototype a new technique or using an existing one. Here, as Amit mentioned, it requires a program that has multiple different functionalities and complexity to actually be using it. So this, in this example, we're not going to actually use our test process, we're going to use Explorer process as a result. That's a quick patch script just to find out the PID of Explorer. Now we're going to attack the Explorer process in the computer. We're going to uh, enter the PID and then touching the taskbar will get the job done. Here it is. And um, last but not least, actually one before the last, uh, we have the set window long pointer. Here again you can see the complexity of the framework comes into play. We're using a specific code execution and then we're using a convertible to actually reuse a very primitive writing technique, which is a combination of virtual allocate and write process, together with a payload, and that's all combined nicely into this uh, one huge instance of a class, and then invoking it with the inject method at the, the bottom will get the job done. So here's a quick demo. It's important to note that since, uh, as Amit explained, there's a specific structure that requires to be retrieved and changed. In this particular case, we're not using a task process. The actual Pinjectra does the location of the PID and retrieves the relevant uh, struct for you. So this is gonna be all Pinjectra uh, doing zero, zero indicating no actual process ID needs to be specified. And last but not least, it's the atomic bombing implementation in Pijectra. Here again, you can see the uh, QUser APC being the code execution class, and then a combination of open thread, open process, virtual allocation, and global add atom to complete the actual writing. And as you can see, you can control the payload, the different flags, and you can experiment with different variation. Again, we will be using the Explorer as a test process. And here it is. Excellent. Well, that will be the last demo of the day. Amit, back to you. Thank you, Itzik. So to summarize, uh, what, we, what we have here is the, a map of the vast territory of true process injection, and we provide an analysis and comparison in a single collection and repository available in our GitHub. Uh, we also provide, of course, uh, the library, Pijectra, for the mix and match generation of process injection attacks, which is uh, mightily, mighty important because this mix and match allows us to cover various combinations that are not provided in, in POCs uh, uh, today. And we describe a new CFG agnostics execution technique, the stack bombing technique, uh, and, a memory, and a memory writing technique coupled with it uh, based on memset and memmove over APC. Thank you very much. I believe we have time for a few questions. Uh, you can you use can the- You can just step up to the microphone. Yes, yeah, step up to the microphone, please. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much.